driver of this car was Mrs. Viola Liuzzo, mother of five children. 20 miles from Selma, Alabama on Route 80, a red and white sedan overtook her car. Several shots were fired. The driverless car veered off the highway and came to a stop at a cattle fence. Mrs. Liuzzo was dead. Arrested and charged with murder were three alleged members of the Ku Klux Klan. One was tried, and the jury was unable to reach a verdict. This is an earthen dam, the temporary grave of three civil rights workers, two white, one Negro, Mickey Schwerner, Andrew Goodman, and James Cheney, beaten and shot to death. Among those indicted for this triple slaying were six men identified as members of the Ku Klux Klan. None has been brought to trial. In this automobile, Reserve Lieutenant Colonel Lemuel Penn was killed by a shotgun blast while riding through Colbert, Georgia. Arrested for this crime were four Knights of the Ku Klux Klan. Two Klansmen were tried and acquitted. In a few short months, five murders, 13 alleged members of the Ku Klux Klan said to be involved in the killings. When such an order as this moves in and takes over the police power, you are completely at their mercy. And their atrocities and their violence can be visited on anybody that disagrees with them in any given situation. What started as a joke a hundred years ago, when a group of men donned bedsheets for a romp, has over the years attracted to it persons charged with acts of harassment, intimidation, and violence throughout the South. Even though the nation has been outraged for many years, the Ku Klux Klan persists with its bizarre ritual and trappings. But a hundred years is a long time for a joke. <laughs> CBS Reports presents The Ku Klux Klan, The Invisible Empire. Here is CBS News correspondent Charles Kuralt. Good evening. The Ku Klux Klan is a secret organization which for 100 years has been allowed to exist in this country. Virtually every president of the United States in the past century has said the Klan has little regard for constituted authority. President Johnson, following the murder of Mrs. Liuzzo in Alabama, defined the Ku Klux Klan as a hooded society of bigots and warned Klansmen to get out of the Klan and return to a decent society before it is too late. After the President's warning, the House on american Activities Committee started a full-scale investigation of the Klan and open hearings are scheduled for next month. The hearings will present witnesses, not only Klansmen, but also victims of Klan activity. However, the committee will not attempt to show the Klan in action. For the next hour, we will take a close look at the Ku Klux Klan from the inside out, examine its leadership, its ritual, its secret initiation, its record of violence. First, let us look at Klansmen without their robes. It is Sunday, the morning after a Ku Klux Klan meeting in Durham, North Carolina. These men are members of the United Clans of America, Knights of the Ku Klux Klan, one of the most exclusive organizations in America. It excludes many Protestants, all Roman Catholics, Jews, Negroes, Spanish Americans, Puerto Ricans, and anyone else who, according to the Ku Klux Klan, is not 100% pure American. I don't hate niggers, man. I don't, I, don't, I don't associate with niggers, but on the other hand, I don't associate with common white trash or Jews or Catholics, if I can help it. This is the Grand Dragon of the North Carolina realm of the United Clans, J. Robert Jones. Former sailor, bricklayer, lightning rod salesman, he now reportedly rules over more than 50 claverns, or chapters, and their 7,000 dues-paying members. I think the nigger has rights in this country. He should have equal rights, but separate rights. It's worked for 100 years in the South, and I think it will work now. But if you was the nicest fella in the world, and and Lyndon Johnson said, I had to associate with you every day. I'd tell Lyndon Johnson to go straight to hell because I would not associate with you. This is the Grand Consul, the late Matt Murphy, who until his recent death was chief legal counsel of the United Clans. His favorite targets were the Negroes, Jews, the Federal Reserve System, and international bankers. I had made speeches before the United Clans of America, and they were the only organization that ever went on record after I had talked for two solid hours on the viciousness of the Federal Reserve Corporation and how it has built the taxpayers and the American citizens out of all the money. 
and that Great Britain has removed the bank from the international bankers, and their bank is back under the crown. Is Nighthawk. This is a Nighthawk of the United Clans in North Carolina. A Nighthawk is responsible for the security of a clavern. Uh, why did you join the clan? Well, I've got a wife, five kids. I think that's enough reason. I want them to be, have a country to raise, be raised up in like I was. I wasn't forced to go to school with niggers. I wasn't forced to eat with them. And I want them to have at least the right that I had. So this act this is Mr. Outlaw. Wherever Jones goes, Mr. Outlaw, the grand Clexter or guard, is at his side. In the group are the three defendants indicted for the killing of Mrs. Liuzzo, Eugene Thomas, William Eaton, and Collie Leroy Wilkins. These men had little to say. They preferred listening to their counsel, Matt Murphy, Jr. I read in my history book that the nigger man, the nigger race, was an inferior race. And that was a history that was taught me when I was in school. That hadn't been too long ago. They always have been, they always will be. Well, where do you think the money is coming from behind the civil rights movement? From the Communist Party, from the Zionist Christ-killing Jews. And I say Christ-killing Jews because they have not been a fluid since they, since they crucified Christ and their relatives can be traced back to the ones that's running the streets today. What about the role of the Catholics in this, Mr. Jones? Uh, the reason Catholic cannot get in this organization, his first allegiance is not to the United States of America. His first allegiance is to the Pope. They believe that the church should rule the government with the Pope at the head. And if they're right, there's a bunch of people in this country that are wrong. Let me uh, say this. We have never had a drop of blood spilled between a white man and a black one in any town in North Carolina that we had the Klan organized. And we are doing our best to keep down trouble. But my people are, everybody in this country is organized with the exception of the white Protestant Gentiles. Your niggers have your knights of your NAACP in court along with your sorry white trash. You've got uh, Benabarith for your uh, Jewish people. Your Knights of Columbus, which is a secret fraternal order, as they say, and nobody's ever talked about investigating that, which they should, uh, in here. But the white Protestant Gentile, the only hope and the only salvation that they have left in this United States today is the, is the United Clans of America Incorporated. We've saved the South twice, or the Klan has, and it looks like we're going to have to do it again. One important Ku Klux Klan official was not at this meeting, the Klan Clud, or chaplain. But there was a Clud in action the night before. You got a bunch of people standing right over here with the cameras and the news saying, hey, some of them ain't got enough backbone to get them a job and go to work. But there might be some good ones in the crowd. I want to tell you, fellas, I'm, I'm just telling you, you fellas right over here, they'll print half of the story. They ain't got enough backbone to tell the truth, so anybody that's alive or the devil, you're going to die and go to hell without God. If all you FBI agents want to check the plan and investigate them, I live on 209 in Dota Avenue, Lexington, North Carolina, and my name is Roy Wood, and I'm not ashamed to be a classman. Amen. This is the Klan Clud in action. The preacher, evangelist, the hellfire speaker, the rabble rouser. He entertains with a mixture of comedy and Christianity. But above all, he preaches racial hatred. Then do you think children is brought up to mix the black and white together? Do you know your horse won't mix with your cow? Your dog won't mix with your hog? And you tell me white people has got a mind and can't think no clearer than that. Listen, friend, we need to turn to God. We need to wake up to God. We had forefathers die to give us freedom. Our forefathers walked barefooted in the snow and fought and died to give us freedom. And now here we sit back because we got a dictator in the White House, a dictator, and you sit in your money down out of bed and ain't willing to stand up and be counted like a man or woman. It takes a man to stand and be a man. Anybody can go down to nigger town and commit adultery with a nigger, but it takes a Christian, a man, to stand for God. Amen. Let me call you farmers to attention to a few things. You raise hogs, and you know when the old hog has a gang of little pigs, she'll try to protect them. You know the dog, when they have a gang of pups, they'll try to protect them. And you tell me you've got a gang of white children running around in your yard, and you're going to stand by and see them sold out to a bunch of niggers. God help you to wake up and try to do what God would have you do. Protect you all. 
Act like a decent person. And then if you don't want to do that, don't be a half-handed hypocrite. Don't be one-sided. Go on to Nicker Town and forget about it. The Klan was born a hundred years ago in Pulaski, Tennessee, as a six-member social club. But six years later, the Klan had half a million members, and the burning cross, the Klan trademark, became a symbol of the violence it used to keep the newly freed Negroes in their place. In 1915, D.W. Griffith produced and directed what has been called the first great feature-length motion picture, The Birth of a Nation, whose subject was the Ku Klux Klan. Today, this film, made 50 years ago, is still shown to Klansmen as the classic example of what other generations of Southerners did to protect white supremacy. These are some scenes from The Birth of a Nation. A chance witnessing of two white children under a bedsheet scaring a group of Negro children is depicted as the birth of the idea for the Klan. The idea is successful. Robed and masked Klansmen are able to frighten the Negroes. In a fight, the Negro sought for scaring a white girl and causing her to jump from a cliff to her death kills a white man. Captured, the killer is taken into the woods and put on trial. The clan passes judgment. The culprit is killed and his body deposited at the door of the lieutenant governor. In the same year the birth of a nation was first released, a new leader rose to head the clan. William Joseph Simmons, one-time salesman of ladies' garters, in this rare newsreel film, leads his followers up Stone Mountain in Georgia for the first initiation ceremony of the reincarnated clan. Simmons added something new to the clan uniform, a stylized face mask, which he alone could wear. He also insisted the clan operate in total secrecy. The clan's sinister power grew as new recruits joined, some through coercion, and its clandestine activities increased. In the first 14 months after World War I, 70 Negroes were lynched, 14 burned. In 1922, Imperial Wizard Simmons could not overcome intra-clan difficulties and was replaced by a dentist from Dallas, Dr. Hiram Evans, who inherited a depleted treasury from Simmons as well as his title of Imperial Wizard. In 1923, Evans established headquarters in Washington to be closer to Congress, the Klan's next target. The Klan was so powerful in Oregon in 1923 that it was able to elect the President of the State Senate and the Speaker of the House. In Ohio, Klan-supported candidates became mayors of Toledo, Akron, Columbus, and other cities. At the National Democratic Convention in New York in 1924, it is estimated that at least 350 delegates were Klansmen, and they were responsible for the defeat of Governor Alfred Smith as the Democratic nominee. By 1925, the Ku Klux Klan was big business. Almost six million Americans now belonged to the Klan, and the organization was grossing $75 million a year. Some 40,000 Klansmen and Klanswomen crowded into Washington on August 8, 1925 to parade down Pennsylvania Avenue. To help the Klan coffers, a flag was used to catch money thrown in by spectators. In the 1920s, the Imperial Wizard of Indiana, David C. Stevenson, was indicted on charges of assault and battery, rape, mayhem, kidnapping, and murder, and found guilty. This scandal caused a sharp drop in Klan membership. In 1940, there was a mild flirtation between the German-American Bund, the believers in the master race, and the Ku Klux Klan, the believers in the supremacy of the white race. They joined up in a rally at Camp Nordland, New Jersey. The Klan. 25 years later, there is evidence that Klan-Nazi friendship is being revived. This year in Houston, Texas, Gerald Walraven, claiming membership in the United Klans, Knights of the Ku Klux Klan, was interviewed by radio station KTRH and was paid by check for his appearance. When the canceled check was returned to the radio station, 
It had been endorsed by Lincoln Rockwell, head of the American Nazi Party, with a swastika stamped beneath his signature. In 1944, Imperial Wizard Dr. James H. Colescott received a bill from the U.S. Collector of Internal Revenue for $685,000 for the Klan's back taxes. Unable to pay, Dr. Colescott disbanded the Klan. But four years later, Colescott's former partner, Dr. Samuel Green, reactivated the Klan, and many new converts were initiated into Klandom, motivated by a desire to keep the Negro in his place. At a rally in Macon, Georgia, Imperial Wizard Green defended the new Klan. We don't hate the Negro. God made him black, and he made us white. And you will find this laid out in the 11th chapter of Genesis, in which he segregated the races. And we knowing that for 5,000 years, the white man has been the supreme race, we the Knights of the Peacock's Klan intend to keep it the white race. Today, the organization differs from the past in that Klansmen are willing to appear in their robes and hoods in daylight. With the advent of the civil rights struggle, the Klan has become more militant. Some groups have paramilitary units, such as this one in North Carolina. Grand Dragon Jones security guards are trained to take care of anything that might happen at Klan rallies. The Klan also sponsors softball teams. Since softball can't be played in robes, KKK letters appear on the uniform to remind the spectators that this team is made up of 100% pure white American Protestant ball players. Sometimes Klansmen engage in more bizarre sport. The letters KKK were carved with a penknife on the chest and stomach of this man in Houston, Texas, after he had been hanged by his knees from an oak tree and flogged with a chain. The Attorney General of Alabama, Richmond Flowers, who is currently investigating the Ku Klux Klan in his state, told us... The Klan to me, as a group primarily of thugs that would use the civil rights issue to foster an organization or a clan as they are, uh, and will take the law into their own hands. They have become more or, less, more or less their own police power. They are a police group within themselves, dedicated to defiance of law, uh, violence. They are, as I have expressed it before, they are a hooded bunch of killers and night riders and uh, floggers that this nation and this state has no use for whatsoever. The strength of the Ku Klux Klan is difficult to estimate among its many secrets is the actual membership total. Students of Klan affairs say there are at least 30 to 50,000 active members, but there are probably as many as a million or more Americans who are strongly sympathetic to the aims of the Klan and who, if pushed to a decision, would join the Klan. When a 100% pure white American citizen applies for membership, his application is carefully checked. If accepted, he can then leave what the Klan calls the alien world and become a member of the Invisible Empire. For the first time in Klan history, CBS News cameras filmed part of a secret initiation ceremony at a clavern in Georgia. Filming had to be done with available light, and the only parts of the ritual we could not film were the secret handshake, the password by which Klansmen identify themselves to each other, and the secret oath of allegiance to the imperial authority of the Klan. This is the ceremony we filmed. For my country, my land, my land, and all, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic of Five initiates appeared before an exalted cyclops, a cloakard, clud, and clagrap, corresponding to a president, lecturer, chaplain, and secretary. The men were presented by the cloakard, and they had been checked out by the cloakan, or investigating committee.
On a makeshift altar before an electrified cross are placed a sword representing ancestral courage and a flag, the emblem of pure patriotism. An open Bible is laid on the flag. A glass of water, which is used to consecrate the initiates, completes the symbolic array. Clarego, or inner guard, sits at the door. On the other side is a clexter, or outer guard. <coughs> the cloakard and two assistants report to the exalted Cyclops. Go ask it, sir. Five men in waiting have each of you to qualify then our travel during to the Mr. K request of citizenship and invisible empire in the United States and the United States of the Q-Club plan. Faithful co-card during your assistance will resume your statement. We have it, Alder. Follow me and be proof. Forward. Huh. Huh. You'll stand in silence and take heed to a plan of prayer. God give us men. Men who can stand before you, them will knock you down, Mr. President Flattery. Tall men, sun crowned, who live above the clock and cook good and private thinking. For while they travel with their tongue more increased, their large professions and their little deeds mingle in self with strife. Lo, freedom weep, wrong rules of hand and waiting just to sleep. God give us men. Right face, huh? Left hand. Left This is the eyes of scrutiny part of the initiation ceremony. Clan members pass by the initiates for one last searching look. You may pay some. Right? Pay! Forward, march! In this room, the initiates swear allegiance to the clan above all things. The secrecy and ritual of these meetings, which seem almost laughable to the outsider, have a grimly serious purpose. Because of its secrecy, the clan can hold sway over a community. When men are initiated into clandom in rituals such as this one, their neighbors will not know they have become clansmen. If some of the initiates are policemen or sheriff's deputies, their fellow officers will not know. If they are jurors, their fellow jurors will not know. Under the cloak of this secrecy, the clan can take over positions of influence and power. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. We recognize our relation to the government of the United States of America, the supremacy of its constitution, the union of states thereon, and the constitutional laws thereof. And we shall ever be true in the faith of maintaining the white supremacy, and will strangely oppose any compromise thereof in any and all things. Are you a native-born white Gentile American citizen? Yes. Do you believe in the tenets of the Christian religion? Yes. yes. Do you esteem the United States of America and its institutions above any other government, civil, political, or ethnological in the whole world? Yes. I'll ask you to kneel on your right knee. And one and all, let us pray. Here, you may not write. There you are no longer aliens or strangers among us, but are citizens with us. And assuming that you have not sworn more and false to deceitfully and assuming your oath, <coughs> and now on behalf of all clanmen assembled, 
welcome you to citizenship in the invisible empire, Knights of the Ku Klux Klan. The five new Klansmen are no longer part of the alien world. Now they are members of the Invisible Empire, entitled to wear the robe and the hood, the proud possessors of the secret handshake and the secret password. And now they can attend clavern meetings and Klan rallies, such as this one in Dunn, North Carolina. The Klan rally has many elements of a carnival. It's an outing for the family. Children start attending these outdoor meetings at an early age. Robes for the youngsters are made by mothers and follow the pattern of adult robes. Rallies always have entertainers, and their material is Klan tailored for the audience. This entertainer recites a poem. The saddest story ever told. When white girl marries a negro, her song of light goes down and glaring spots of sin appear on her wedding gown. And white and black men stand aghast while viewing this strange role and mutter. They will wreck themselves and damn each other's soul. Three days and nights she felt black lips pressed snug against her own, and on the form her troubled soul let out a frightened groan. And so I staggered through my days far from God's love and grace, till now I know no black man lives can take a white man's place. Thank you. The featured speaker is usually a well-known personality. At this rally, it was the late Matt Murphy Jr., Imperial Consul or Chief Legal Counsel of the United Clans. And I'll tell you this, and go to your congressman, ask him what to do, and tell him what to do, because they're about to pass a bill out there that if you strike your civil rights worker, it's a federal offense. And they'll haul you before a federal court and take you to the most favorable county they can find and cut your head off if they can. And when I say cut your head off, I mean they'll send you to the federal penitentiary. That's the way they're doing it. That's the way they call the shots. So for God's sake, get your congressman. And if he doesn't do it, elect somebody that will fight such a bill as that. As extra added attraction, Matt Murphy introduced the three men indicted for the murder of civil rights worker Mrs. Viola Liuzzo. Mr. W.O. Eaton. <laughs> Mr. Eugene Thomas. Hey! And the boy who stood under the battle guns, Carly Leroy Wilkins. Hey! And befitting the occasion of a Ku Klux Klan rally, the three men were besieged by autograph hunters, and they willingly obliged. Klan members accused of crimes must be defended. Their consuls or attorneys must be paid. In addition, money is required for operating expenses and leaders' salaries, which run as high as $1,500 a month. The Invisible Empire needs a treasury. But where the money comes from and how much is a secret. What is known is that initiation fees are between ten and twenty-five dollars, and yearly dues for assessments range from three to fifteen dollars. A conservative estimate is that the Klan is a million dollar a year enterprise. The money comes from initiation fees, dues, robe and hood sales, individual contributions, and from what can be raised by a Klan clud at a rally. There might be a businessman that's prosperous and you can afford to give a thousand. You can afford to pay one of the men's salary. There might be a businessman, there is. There may be some company that can write a check for one man's year's salary to do nothing but set up units throughout North Carolina. Whatever you have, $10, $5, walk down with it. Will you do that? Is there others? You know we ought to be able tonight, we ought tonight to be able to come way on up the ladder. We're going to count this. The men and women in robes receive torches and the parade around the kuklos, or circle, begins.
you are watching, 700 robed and hooded men marching around a burning cross, took place in the United States in 1965. <laughs> CBS reports the Ku Klux Klan, the Invisible Empire, will continue in a moment. When this man launched his new boat a few summers ago, he got an unpleasant surprise. Pollution. Some of our cities and towns had been dumping their wastes into our water. So he fixed his boat up again, launched it again, and... Pollution again! Some of our mines and factories had been dumping their wastes into our water. But this year is different. The man had helped work for a clean water program in his community. Waste treatment plants were built, regulations were enforced, and the waters were clean again. He had help, of course, help from people like him, who wanted clean water and worked for it. There are more people doing that every day. Clean water programs are underway in every state and many communities. How about where you live? Do you want clean water? Take the first step. Send for the facts. Write Clean Water, Washington, D.C. CBS reports the Ku Klux Klan, the Invisible Empire, continues. Klan leaders are sensitive about the reputation the Klan has for intimidation and violence. In an attempt to erase this image, they have adopted a new policy, which in effect says, look at us, we are a fraternal organization, we have nothing to hide. Imperial wizards and grand dragons no longer avoid the press. Clan leaders sport crew cuts, button-down collars, and well-tailored suits. The most publicized and best organized clan leader is Imperial Wizard Robert Shelton of the United Clans Knights of the KKK. Shelton spends much of his time in his Tuscaloosa, Alabama office, constantly listening to tape recordings of Martin Luther King Jr. while he examines pictures of civil rights demonstrators. Those he can identify are circled and filed. Shelton explains why. We have a division in our organization called the KBI, the Klan Bureau of Investigation, and I might add it is pretty effective. We're able to uncover a lot of evidence that uh, other departments uh, might miss. It is estimated that Imperial Wizard Shelton is the highest paid officer in Clandom. He has a private airplane, a limousine, and he travels constantly. As Imperial Wizard, Shelton has several Grand Dragons, or state governors, under his command. Grand Dragon of the Georgia realm, Calvin Craig. Grand Dragon of South Carolina, Robert Scoggins. Grand Dragon of Mississippi, E.L. McDaniel. Florida's Grand Dragon, Don Cothran. Grand Dragon of Tennessee, Raymond Anderson. Klan leaders constantly preach race hatred. Every Klan speaker warns against mongrelization of the races. And hearing this theme of white supremacy repeated over and over again, some Klan members come to believe their status is threatened and commit acts of violence. Immediately, Klan officials deny responsibility for the criminal acts of their members. In rare cases in which Klansmen are arrested, the leaders even deny these men are members of their group. Yet, it is known that there are approximately 5,000 hardcore members of the Klan who are obsessed and fanatical. Fanatical enough to set fires, bomb, dynamite, and even kill. The question is, how can Klan leaders avoid responsibility for violence when they themselves repeatedly whip up their members to action? Go to any Klan meeting. This is what you'll hear. White man, is this your country or does it belong to the nigger? White man. If you want your daughter, your son to marry a nigger, hold up your hand and let me look you in the eyes if you're a white man or a white woman in this great nation there. We're on the move. That's what the niggers are hollering. 
We're on the move. We're on the go. We're going to run the white people down. We're going to kick them in the teeth. We're going to take our place in society. I got news for nigger. You nigger. We're on the move too. I don't believe in segregation. I believe in slavery. The Klan says it does not advocate intimidation, harassment, or violence, that it is a peaceful organization. Let us take a look at some proven Klan activities. In the small community of Gray, Georgia, the only movie theater in town permitted Negroes to sit in the balcony. The Klan decided this was not a healthy thing for the white people, and every Friday night, 50 carloads of robed Klansmen circled the theater. Today, the movie house in Gray, Georgia is closed a victory for the Klan. Further examples of Klan intimidation were uncovered in an injunction lawsuit in the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals in New Orleans. The hearings revealed that in Bogalusa, Louisiana, sometimes called Klan Town, USA, some of the city's estimated 1,000 Klan members were auxiliary policemen. The city attorney, who is responsible for prosecuting charges against Klansmen arrested for violence against civil rights workers, was himself identified as a Klansman. The powerful Bogalusa clan moved this year against radio station WBOX, whose owner was one of a group which invited former Arkansas Congressman Brooks Hayes to make a speech in Bogalusa on race relations. Klansmen made hundreds of anonymous phone calls to the station sponsors. The effect was immediate. 75% of the commercials were canceled. WBOX is still broadcasting, but at a loss. Although the Klan says it has respect for law and order, there are records of countless crimes which some Klansmen performed for reasons they deemed proper. Judge Daniel Duke, who has fought the Klan for 25 years in Georgia, tells how the Klan administered its own kind of justice. It have a, the Klokan Committee, or the committee that administered the floggings, one would get on one side of this man who was doubled up with his wrist handcuffed to his ankles, who had been taken from his home, he thought by legal warrant, and who had unknown to him been reported by someone to be a labor organizer. And uh, they equated that to communism, and then they equated that to race mixing. And they would usually equate that to, say, some Jewish person was back of it, and uh, a multiplicity of uh, things, anything that appealed to hate, prejudice. They'd take this man and they would beat him unmercifully. The Ku Klux Klan does not stop at floggings. Eight years ago in Birmingham, Alabama, a group of Klansmen committed the most heinous crime short of murder. As a warning to civil rights leaders, they abducted this man and castrated him. Um, they hit me in the back of the head, told me to lay down. And they all grabbed me, stretched me out. Well, one stood on this arm, and one stood on this one. And one caught my leg and spread it apart. Then he got help from the other one, and they spread my leg apart. The boss ordered him to do your weight, and they went to cutting on me. When they got through cutting me, they put term time on me. Said I wasn't hollering could tempt on to make it hate more. I don't believe they're human. But not only individuals suffer at the hands of the Klan. Sometimes whole cities are victims. In one large city, there is evidence that Klan-inspired violence touched off one of the most vicious racial riots in recent history. The place was St. Augustine, Florida. This Klansman was primarily responsible for what happened. Reverend Connie Lynch is probably the most effective rabble-rouser and preacher of bigotry the Klan has to offer. Most people would kill you if you put a Jersey bull in among their white-faced Herefords. They'd shoot you. But they tell me that I don't even have the right to fight to protect the white race. Let these black bucks come in. They said it was going to be settled in the bedroom. Well, I got some news for them. There may be some bedroom cases, all right, but when the smoke clears away, there won't be no bedroom cases. Little Rock, Oxford, Birmingham, Albany, Georgia, Bogalusa, Louisiana, Connie Lynch was there. And when racial violence was predicted for St. Augustine, Florida, Connie Lynch went there, too. Negroes were trying to integrate the bathing beaches. 
and the Florida Advisory Committee to the U.S. Civil Rights Commission warned that the city was becoming a racial super bomb with a short fuse. The tempo of violence increased rapidly in St. Augustine. The Klan paraded in the streets, unmindful of the rain. And I'll say this to the stooges, I want to take this back to the enemy's camp, to the niggers and all of their cohorts, uh, that we white people are going to rise up 140 million strong. And On the night of June 25th, 1964, the fuse burned down and the racial bomb exploded. St. Augustine was the scene of a frightening riot. Scores of people were injured, 19 hospitalized. Connie Lynch had done his work. I spoke for the white people. The white people rallied behind it, and we kicked the living hell out of the niggers, sent the out-of-town niggers to the hospital and out of the state, put back to their own hometowns where they ought to have been, and the niggers in St. Augustine got quiet and went back over nigger town where they belonged. These examples of Ku Klux Klan activity are not unusual. For the past 100 years, the invisible empire, this self-proclaimed second national government, has reserved to itself police authority and the right to correct what it considers wrong. Although some Klansmen have been apprehended and tried for their crimes, the fact remains that the perpetrators of more than 225 bombings and 1,000 acts of racial violence, reprisal, and intimidation in the last 10 years have not been arrested. The problem is that law enforcement itself is often in the hands of authorities who either belong to or sympathize with the Ku Klux Klan. The publisher of the Atlanta Constitution, Ralph McGill, explains why citizens are powerless to protest in such situations. In a small community, you too often find that the sheriff is a member, or that the deputies are members, and the poor white man, or more particularly the poor Negro in a small community, he well knows that he has no protection at all, that the law isn't going to help him because the law is more often than not in the Klan or sympathetic with it in the small southern community. The Grand Dragon of Georgia, Calvin Craig, confirmed that law enforcement officers are Klansmen. We have policemen, we have sheriffs, we have farmers, we have uh, uh, mechanics, and uh, myself, I'm an operating engineer. One law enforcement officer sympathetic to the Klan, Sheriff Lawrence Rainey of Neshoba County, Mississippi, was charged in the death of civil rights workers Schwerner, Goodman, and Cheney. Recently, Sheriff about. Rainey was introduced at a Klan rally by the Grand Dragon of Mississippi, E.L. McDaniel, and, and offered a testimonial to members of the Klan. I would like at this time to call Sheriff Lawrence A. Rainey from Neshoba County to the platform for a statement. Are you proud he's here? It's in the car. <laughs> Can't do without that. No, I was just down here. I've been accused by the FBI, by the Klan and everything. And so I come down today to see the head men and investigate it and see what there was to it. <laughs> and I found it so far to be mighty good. They just done a lot of lying about it. I met some of the best fellows I think they are in... Alabama and Mississippi and other places. And I've had uh, they some, some deputies out has been investigating it and they reported me a while ago they'd met some fine people and thought it was a mighty good organization. Thank you. Let's give him a hand if you're glad he got on this platform. A true, great, white America. The Klan is not a single, strongly organized group. It is composed of splinter groups fighting each other for new members and new territory. On Memorial Day weekend, Robert Shelton's chief rival, James Venable, head of the National Knights of the KKK, took his clan north to a site 25 miles from Cincinnati, Ohio. Both Venable and Shelton believed the whites in the north 
worried about Negro civil rights demands in their own communities are ready to embrace the Klan. This was the first open Klan rally in Ohio in more than 30 years. The fact that the Klan is getting bolder was demonstrated by the site which was selected, right alongside Superhighway 75. Klan robes, many of which had been stored away for years, were put out for an airing. Since the building of a cross for the Klan ritual requires skill, out-of-staters volunteered to hammer the cross pieces, wrap the burlap carefully, and then soak their handiwork with a mixture of gasoline and motor oil, a half gallon of gasoline and five pounds of oil for every foot of the cross. The clan added a new touch to attract crowds, a skydiving show with parachute jumpers releasing clan flags and then landing on clan-blessed land. The northernmost penetration of the clan took place last month near Cleveland, Ohio. All cars headed for the rally were searched for weapons, and police confiscated high-powered rifles, shotguns, and pistols. There were the usual preparations, including the raising of the cross. At a nearby restaurant, men lined up to get applications for membership in Imperial Wizard Venable's Knights of the Ku Klux Klan. That evening, 25 men and women, kept at a safe distance, picketed the meeting. The burning of the cross was the high point of this rally, only 21 miles from Cleveland. Does the invisible empire have a right to continue its activities, either in the north or the south? In our democracy, freedom of speech must be accorded this organization. Klansmen have a right to meet and wear uniforms. If the Klan is a fraternal order, it should enjoy the privileges of other orders. But the truth is that among all such organizations, only the Klan has a history of violence. Lawmakers have not ignored the Klan. 22 states have passed laws prohibiting the wearing of masks in public, and 52 southern communities have outlawed masks and cross burnings. But even these laws have been ineffective. Klansmen can still legally wear masks and burn crosses on private property. They still intimidate and harass citizens. Now, the Office of the Attorney General is working on new anti-Klan legislation for submission to Congress. Attorney General Katzenbach was asked what form this legislation might take. Well, I think it could take a, uh, a number of forms. One would be to follow the analogy with respect to the Communist Party and uh, to seek uh, uh, full disclosure of their membership and a uh, listing of the uh, Klan and its members and its officers as a sort of glare of publicity. Another uh, approach, uh, perhaps a better approach, would be to follow the pattern of the existing laws, but uh, to expand their scope of, uh, of federal jurisdiction under them and to increase the penalties under them so that the federal government uh, could get a more deep involvement. We've put up with the Klan for a hundred years in this country. How long is it going to take for us to see the end of the Klan? I don't know when we'll see the end of the Klan. I think the end of the Klan is uh, any kind of an effective organization of any sort at all is within sight. I doubt that uh, the Klan is going to be a very effective force anywhere as uh, 10 years from now. Today, still another investigation of the Klan is being conducted in Washington by the House Un-American Activities Committee. The committee has issued more than 200 subpoenas. The chairman, Representative Edwin Willis of Louisiana. It is certainly a clear and present danger to uh, communities and to areas within which they operate. There's no question about it. It's perilous, it's terroristic, uh, now, I wouldn't want to dignify them into believing that they're clear and present danger to our government of the United States. Uh, I hope that we can extinguish uh, the flame before the fire reaches such proportions. One of the subcommittee members, Representative Charles Weltner of Georgia, was asked how the Klan could be curbed. One of the reasons it's difficult to convict a Klansman is because nobody knows who else is a Klansman. 
Nobody knows uh, whether jurors are Klansmen. They are under a mandate to lie about their Klan activity uh, when they're examined. That's a mandate higher than the oath that uh, is required of all jurors. One of the reasons it's hard to convict Klansmen is because of the secrecy, the terror, the unknown quantity, the mystery of the Klan. Now, when we strip this organization of those elements, then the Klan becomes a group of small, willful men who uh, have devoted their activities to hatred, and they are simply not going to be accepted for what they really are when the people know what they really are. I predict that there's going to be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth, and all the protestations about how great and how dedicated uh, the Klansmen are and how attached they are to Christianity. I'm afraid a few little balloons are going to be busted before this thing is over. The impending committee hearings will focus the national spotlight on the Ku Klux Klan, and it is possible that part of the invisible empire may become visible. Defections have been noted. Earlier in this program, we showed Reverend Roy Woodall, a Klan clud, in action. A few days ago, Woodall quit the United Clans Incorporated. Last week at his home near Lexington, North Carolina, we asked him why. Well, if people would just check the record and see this, now who, who is leading the Klan and what are they and what do they stand for? That would be a logical question. So take any individual, what if he be in the Klan or out, check the leadership. Say, for example, we have people was uh, painter contractors. As far as I know, failures. We have people with uh, insurance agents. As far as I know, failures. We have people with concrete business. As far as I know, failures. And such as that, just uh, failed out and flunked out. Couldn't promote leadership and uh, just lost out everything they had. And then, well, and they couldn't find nothing else to do, as the fellow said, they made him a clans leader. Take, for instance, you make a man a security guard and pin a little old bar or something on him. He thinks he's a big wheel and a deal, and, and therefore he'll follow it till he spend all this money every weekend for gas, run up and down the road, right, just that he can get out there and strut with them bars on, think he's a big shot of some kind. If he go back home and check his home, no doubt he wouldn't have decent food in his house to eat. Is there immorality in the Klan, an unchristian kind of activity? Now, if a man will go to a Klan rally, professing to be a preacher, let me put emphasis on that, professing to be a preacher, gets up and bows his head and says he's praying to the Lord for people to help give. And then plant a man out in the crowd with a $100 bill, one with a $50, and say, now who will give $100? And ask the, then that man will come forth to try to bewitch somebody else to come. Now that's deceiving the people. Do the, some of the Klan leaders misuse the people's money? If he's going out and promote leadership, why ride around in a big car, telephone in it, jump out at rallies, which you fellas know does, everybody else, and gets up on the platform, makes his speech, holds his rally, they take up the money, and then they're off. And they have no more leadership from there, and next year they'll come back with the same thing. Another rally, big Cadillac, a big speech, and away again. At every Klan meeting, Reverend Whittle, they go around and collect money. What happens to that money? Where does it go? Well, as far as we know, it all finds its way in the pockets of leaders. Now, if you know where any else, when I don't myself as an individual, uh, I just couldn't tell you. Now, we know that they do take up money every rally. Now, we know that. The news knows it. Uh, everybody there knows it. They pass their buckets around and they do take up money. But as far as we know, that's the end of it. Uh, we don't have no uh, record of nothing else as far as I know now. Somebody else may know something I don't know, but all we know is people ride around, lives in their motels, drive their Cadillacs, eat their ribeye steak, and laugh at the poor people as they go by. When the House on american Activities Committee begins its hearings, the confrontation between committee members and Klan leaders and followers should provide interesting answers. If an imperial wizard is asked at these hearings to name members of his Klan group who may be judges, police chiefs, and legislators, what will happen? Will he do so, or will he choose to plead the Fifth Amendment? What will happen when a Klan clud is asked where the money he collects at a rally ends up? What will the array of Klegels and Clads and Cluds say 
when they are asked about the reports of secret clan bank accounts and the names of fish and game clubs in the South. And how does a check to a Klansman end up in the accounts of the Nazi party? What will happen when a grand dragon is asked to give the names of Klansmen who may have participated in acts of racial violence? What will the traveling ministers of the Klan faith say if they are asked how race riots start? Will they plead the Fifth Amendment? And if certain sheriffs are asked under oath whether they are Klan members and whether they know the details of unpunished crimes, how will they answer? Those House Committee hearings on the Klan begin next month. The Attorney General's recommendations for new laws may be expected by the end of the year. Washington is moving against the Klan. But whatever happens to the Ku Klux Klan will not finally happen in Washington. It will happen in those small towns of the South whose natural spirit of generosity and justice have been damped and whose leaders have fallen silent. If the Klan prospers, it will draw its strength from such communities. If the Klan falls, it will be because one man and then another in such places have made up their own minds that a free society cannot coexist with an invisible empire. This is Charles Kuralt. Good night. Ku Klux Klan, The Invisible Empire, was filmed and edited by the staff of CBS Reports under the supervision and control of CBS News.